It's easy to say there should be absolutely no animal experimentation, but without it, there just isn't going to be any medical progress. And if I have to choose between the life of some animal involved in an experiment that leads to research that might help my kid or cure my kid of some terrible thing, and the life of my kid, well, I'm going to choose my kid's life. And so would anybody else. That's just how it is. Now, similarly to our professors, advocates of invasive animal research frequently like to claim that animal experimentation is vital for preventing, curing or alleviating human diseases. Regrettable though it is, they tell us animals must die in order to find cures for devastating human diseases. And uh, unfortunately, these cures can be developed in no other way. Now these are direct quotations from the scientific publications of which my favourite one is this. Medical progress would be severely maimed by prohibition or curtailing of animal experiments and catastrophic consequences would ensue. But are such claims actually true? Each year, more than 100 million uh, animal experiments are conducted around the world. And when we're conducting such large numbers of experiments, I think it's inevitable that there are going to be cases where outcomes in uh, animals and humans are similar and there are going to be apparent links to human healthcare advancements. Although, of course, we can question whether animals were really necessary to achieve those advancements. And, of course, we can speculate as to uh, the alternate paths that history might have taken had uh, the financial and other scientific resources been redirected into other fields of research. On the other hand, there are also large numbers of cases in which uh, drugs have been tested uh, in animals and found to be safe and then gone on to human patients and consumers and caused uh, serious side effects and even deaths. And then again, there are cases in which uh, animal and human outcomes have been similar. So the trouble with examining lists of cases like this is it's possible to find examples on either side of the argument. It's possible to cherry pick uh, these cases to put either side of the argument. So we need a more systematic way to try and evaluate uh, how useful animal experiments really are in contributing to human healthcare advancements. In seven additional reviews, uh, animal models uh, fail to reliably predict important human toxicities such as carcinogenicity and teratogenicity, which are the propensity to cause cancer and birth defects respectively, two of the most important human toxicities. So what this evidence tells us is that even though um, animal experiments may sometimes uh, achieve similar outcomes to those occurring in human patients and in consumers, and even though there may occasionally be apparent links to human healthcare advancements, Overall, animal experiments constitute a highly inefficient means of trying to advance human health care and they're unreliably predictive for human toxicity. Advocates who claim that animal research is generally useful in trying to advance human health care are voicing an opinion. And whilst I strongly support the right of such people to hold an opinion, it's important that we remember that opinions are not evidence, no matter how earnestly those opinions are held or what the credentials or personal experiences of the people expressing them. The actual evidence on this matter is quite clear. Animal experiments uh, are generally insufficiently predictive of human outcomes to contribute uh, significantly to the development of clinical interventions that uh, have a real potential for being effective in human patients and they're unreliably predictive for human toxicity. That's what the evidence tells us. So the best evidence that we have on this issue is actually quite clear and very consistent. Animal experiments rarely, if ever, contribute to the development of clinical interventions that are effective in human patients and the unreliable predictors of human toxicity. It's obviously scientifically uh, invalid and unreliable to try and use an animal species to predict what happens in human patients and consumers. Sometimes you get a similar outcome, sometimes you don't, and that really seems to be potluck. Uh, the first time you test in human beings, uh, it, it, really is, uh, it really is the first time. And if, if we've previously tested in animals and we feel that we have some confidence about what may occur in human beings because of those previous animal tests, and what we have there is a false sense of security. Now, 
is it any more valid to test in, uh, for example, a cat to try to predict what's going to occur in another cat? Well, yes it is in the sense that we've removed the interspecies extrapolation. Uh, so scientifically, uh, a cat is a better model for another cat. But is it ethical to conduct an invasive procedure uh, which is not going to benefit the individual uh, animal concerned in order to try to help other animals later? We don't consider it ethical to conduct harmful procedures on human beings to help other human beings. It's no more ethical to conduct harmful, harmful procedures on animals in order to help other animals. Uh, what I think is, is wrong is that they, uh, they assume, they make uncritical assumptions about the value of their research. And it's understandable given that their careers depend upon receiving grants to conduct this research, successfully conduct the research, publish the results of, of studies without which their careers uh, will not succeed. I think it's understandable that uh, they have a tendency perhaps to, to not question as much as they should uh, the value of this research. But I, I think that's the problem. I think that they, they make assumptions uh, about the value of this research uh, which have not been uh, critically examined and which cannot stand up to critical scrutiny in fact. So in a sense I think that we're actually being more scientific than the so-called animal scientists or animal researchers because uh, it is actually us rather than them who are subjecting a lot of this research to critical scrutiny, critical evaluation, uh, calling for evidence and examining the evidence where it exists. How often are painkillers used? Although the use of painkillers is adequate in many procedures, unfortunately it's, it's not adequate in others, uh, partly because of concerns whether well-founded or otherwise that uh, drug use uh, such as painkillers will alter experimental outcomes. The core principle of uh, animal experimentation regulation and policy around the world is that the likely costs of animal research must be balanced against the expected benefits. When considering animal research overall, we cannot reasonably conclude that the benefits to human patients or consumers or to those motivated by scientific curiosity or profit exceed the costs incurred by the animals used in these procedures. And these commonly uh, include serious physical harm, uh, pain, stress and suffering when they are subjected to certain procedures and as a result of laboratory environments, disruption of important social relationships and also death. In fact, it's only possible to conclude that such research is ethically justified if a profoundly unequal weighting is applied in which relatively infrequent or minor human benefits are considered more important than the serious adverse impacts commonly experienced by laboratory animals. justifications for such profound differences in moral consideration and treatment uh, between humans and the animals that we use in laboratories are uh, purported major differences in our cognitive capacities and our related psychosociological capacities. So we're talking about things like communicative abilities, complex behaviours and theories of mind. However, whenever we identify a characteristic that we consider to be uniquely human, any reasonable characteristic that we think is morally relevant, it seems to be only a period of time until we identify that characteristic in animal species. And there are also human beings who are seriously ill or injured, the very young or the very old, who lack those characteristics, sometimes entirely. And yet such human beings are still deserving of moral consideration, and we certainly don't consider it to be ethical to exploit them for our own ends. We're constantly learning more about the abilities of all the remarkable animals with whom we share our wealth. And our frequent failures to appreciate their value, I think, reveals far more about are our shortcomings than about theirs. The lives of the animals that we use in laboratories are valuable. They do have intrinsic worth and it does matter morally when we kill them. Before we destroy all of those lives, and there are such large numbers involved, we must, I think, be reasonably sure that the, all the killing will be worth it, uh, that the amount of good uh, will outweigh the harm. And according to the best evidence we have, it's quite clear that the vast majority of animal research clearly fails that test.
I think lack of transparency uh, and public accountability are major issues with animal research. The claim is usually that uh, it would be this information is, is so sensitive to the safety and security of researchers and their institutions, or so commercially sensitive that it cannot be uh, released publicly. But of course, the general public pays through its taxation dollars for most of this research. There is a substantial and entirely legitimate public interest in things like the health and safety of patients and consumers and the lives of laboratory animals. And for both ethical and scientific reasons, I think it's really important that uh, society has much better information about uh, the animal research that, that it's paying for than is currently the case. For example, uh, the systematic reviews have indicated quite clearly that the vast majority of this research does not yield the, the benefits about it that are, that are commonly claimed and used to justify the research. This indicates quite clearly that we need to be subjecting this research to far more critical scrutiny than is currently the case, and far more accurately weighing up the likely human benefits against the, the cost, the cost to the animals and the financial and scientific uh, costs, the consumption of public resources that go into this research. So in order for that to happen, I think it's really important that uh, the details of the research uh, are released and made publicly available for independent public and scientific scrutiny well prior to these experiments being approved and conducted. So the kinds of things that we need to know is uh, what, what species of animals are going to be used, uh, how many animals, whether there's been any statistical justification for animal numbers or whether the numbers have simply been plucked out of thin air as is uh, so often the case with animal research. Um, what the procedures are exactly that the animals will be subjected to, what level of anaesthesia and painkiller use there will be, uh, what are the housing conditions, what opportunities for environmental enrichment and socialisation opportunities for social species and so on. Uh, these kinds of details should be made available in full well prior to the research being approved and conducted, uh, both for ethical reasons and also to allow independent uh, scientific scrutiny of the proposed uh, research protocols. Furthermore, once the research has been conducted, the results of the research should be made publicly available in a timely fashion, both to uh, help inform future uh, research and experimental licensing um, decisions, uh, for example, to enable scientists to see what research is going on in their fields to prevent unwarranted experimental duplication, and also to enable ethics committees and others to assess whether the uh, claimed benefits of the research uh, actually happened afterwards and whether the cost to the animals uh, were accurately predicted uh, prior to the experiments being approved, so to help uh, inform f future licensing decisions. Provided experiments are conducted competently, they can usually be argued to at least advance scientific knowledge if they don't duplicate previous work. There is value um, in conducting animal experiments. Uh, there is advancement of scientific knowledge, there is satisfaction of scientific curio curiosity, and so on. And if there were no costs involved in doing this research, uh, it would be a fair argument to say that this research is justified. But of course there are costs, there are substantial costs. There are the costs to the lives of the uh, well over 100 million animals that are used in this research each year. You can argue that there are costs to human patients and consumers when the outcomes in humans is, uh, differs from what was predicted by prior animal studies and patients are harmed. Uh, there are costs when alternate research fields and uh, strategies for advancing public health are not pursued uh, because of lack of funding, some of which has been consumed by animal studies, and so on. So there are very substantial costs involved in doing this kind of research. And in order to make uh, a rational argument that this research should proceed, we need to be reasonably sure that the benefits arising from all this research will be worth the costs. So I'm not trying to argue that there are no benefits. Uh, you can at least argue that the scientific curiosity of, of some people is satisfied, but are those benefits sufficiently large to justify the costs involved? And when you take a realistic uh, view of the costs and you look at the costs and the benefits without bias, then the conclusions are very, very clear. The overwhelming majority of this research is not justified on a cost-benefit basis and should not be approved. I think what we need to do is to 
address the uh, misperception that uh, this research is generally predictive for human outcomes and generally helps to advance human health care. I think what we need to be doing is uh, conducting studies such as the ones that I've done and which are described in my book in which we look in a systematic and large-scale way uh, to see how often this research actually translates into uh, benefits for, for human patients and consumers. And we need to then be getting that information to uh, the scientific communities, the regulatory authorities, uh, legislators, uh, students and others with an interest in this field. So what I've been doing and what some of my colleagues have been doing is starting to present this research at scientific conferences in recent years internationally. We need to publish reviews of this kind of research in the uh, journals, in the relevant disciplines, uh, the medical journals, the uh, scientific journals. We need to be calling upon scientists and others to question uncritical assumptions which are commonly made about the value of this research. It's understandable that people whose careers depend on uh, successfully competing for grants to conduct research and whose careers depend upon successfully publishing papers about, about this research to perhaps tend to overstate the value of that research when they're competing for those grants. Um, however, we need to, I think, put forward, you know, put forward a call uh, for people to look much more critically at the value of, of this research that's being conducted and to much more accurately and fairly weigh up the uh, benefits of this research against the costs uh, of conducting this research.